Thank you, Jay, and thank you for the invitation. I feel uh, we're all quite, we're quite, quite packed in here, but hopefully it doesn't get too hot. So it's very difficult to know how to pitch this talk because I didn't know who the audience would be. We have astronomers in the audience, some of my colleagues um, and others, but how many astronomers do we have here? People who would classify themselves as an astronomer. Arash, okay, we have a couple, not very many. So I hope that I've gone general enough um, but please ask me questions if, if you're confused or if I'm going off down the wrong track. So this is uh, software telescopes from the point of view of an astronomer. And so there's probably different ways you can define what a software telescope might be, but I'm going to give you my opinion as someone who's a user and someone who's interested in the science that we actually get from these telescopes. So for me, a software telescope is one that's not defined by the metal or the infrastructure on the ground, but one is only defined by the flexibility within the system that we build at the back end to actually process the signals and allow us to deliver that core science that we want. So this uh, picture that you see at the front here, um, this, this is a real image. This is not the square kilometre array because there's no actual metal on the ground yet. Construction will begin this year and as Jay mentioned, we've just had the, uh, the creation of the, the observatory itself with the ratification from, from enough governments around the world. This is the Murchison Widefield Array, which is a precursor telescope. Uh, it shares a lot of the common sort of infrastructure that we might use and it's also a test bed for building the SKA, but it's really a, a microcosm of what the SKA will be in terms of scale and in terms of ambition for the science that we actually want to deliver. Okay, so I'm not really going to give an outline of the talk, I'm just going to dive straight in, but I just want to place this in context for where we're looking in the universe with the square kilometre array. And so this is very much a logarithmic scale of the, the size of the universe. And I apologise to anybody I'm standing in front of the screen for. Uh, and so some of these telescopes here are the ones that we currently use in Australia, ones doing great science. Uh, and the ones that we're looking towards for the future. So we have here a mix of optical and radio observatories. Uh, ELMA is in the millimetre, but we'll call that radio. Um, and optical telescopes are the ones we naturally usually think of. There's the Anglo-Australian telescope, a four metre telescope in New South Wales. It gives us nice images. There's the European Southern Observatory um, VLT, that's in South America. They're eight metre telescopes, each of them. And these are sort of the, the pinnacle of optical telescopes around the world at the moment. We use them quite extensively to be able to push beyond our own galaxy, beyond the local group of galaxies, and really deep into the universe where we're looking past halfway, you know, the, the, when the universe was half its current age. In fact, we can push back to when it was about 2 billion years old. And just for context, we're at about 14 billion years at the moment. So the nice thing about the radio facilities is it allows us to push even deeper and deeper because a lot of the radio information that we get, the universe is transparent to that and so nothing blocks it, there's no dust to absorb it. And so it's really about looking for really weak signals to be able to push all the way back to when the very first stars and galaxies were forming in that first billion years of the universe. And that's what we call the cosmic dawn. It's the epoch of reionization. And that's the period of the universe that's sort of missing in our understanding. If we're trying to understand the full evolution of the universe from the Big Bang till now, that's the piece that's currently missing. And we can look at that with radio telescopes. So in the future, we'll use the SKA, and in particular, the low frequency component that I'll talk about. Currently, we use the Murchison Widefield Array. And this is one antenna, if you like, of, of the MWA. And that's based in the Murchison region here in Western Australia, which is why it's a telescope that we care a lot about. Okay, so this is a slide I only added sort of at the last minute because it occurred to me that people might not know why we do radio astronomy. Why don't we just look in the optical? Why don't we don't just look at other frequencies? What does radio astronomy provide for us that we can't get from other wavelengths? So really, radio astronomy allows us to access two types of sources. Um, ones are what I'll call active sources, and the other one is, is uh, sources that are emitting hydrogen gas. And so these are two really um, key components. So what sort of things generate radio emission? Well, there's, there's broadband signals uh, and magnetic fields are, are the key to a lot of those signals. And so if you have uh, supermassive black holes at the centres of other galaxies, if you have regions of galaxies forming stars, they have very strong magnetic fields and you get uh, charged particles cycling around those magnetic fields and we get what we call synchrotron radiation. So that's broadband radiation, it tends to be very dominant in the radio. So if we look with our radio telescopes, we see galaxies that are very, very active, have strong magnetic fields. There's also a thermal emission, and by that it just means that the temperature of the source means that we get emission in the radio. 
So those are relatively cool things like planets, cool stars, we can access those. Uh, and then there's things like rotating neutron stars, pulsars, where you have radio emission coming off the surface. Uh, there's a very active um, field of research for them in the radio. And then for my personal interest is hydrogen gas. So at the formation of the universe, 75% of the, of the matter in the universe was hydrogen, almost 25% helium, and then there's a little bit of uh, lithium and beryllium. All the other elements in the universe are created by stars. So after the fact, after the Big Bang. So the story of hydrogen in the universe is really the story of the universe itself. And in fact, it's that hydrogen gas in the very early universe that tells us about the first stars and the first galaxies, how they formed, how big they were, where they were. And that's why looking at very, very early hydrogen gas in that first billion years of the universe helps us to fill in that gap of, of sort of the birth of the universe. So hydrogen gas is a real key. So active galaxies and hydrogen gas, this is why we do radio astronomy. Okay, so let's move along to the Square Kilometre Array project. The Square Kilometre Array is a global observatory. You see the two flags here, these are the two host countries for the mid-frequency component in Southern Africa, mostly in South Africa, but also a few other countries. And here in Australia, we have the low frequency component. And I'll talk about in a moment what, what that means. You can see all the flags here. On the left is uh, this nice map of the world that shows the countries that are heavily involved in the SKA. And there are more and more countries getting involved um, from, from a government point of view. But scientifically, it's much broader than this in terms of involvement. And you can see that really in, in this map here, where all of these different uh, little figures here show institutions that are contributing in some way to the construction of the project, the construction of the observatory, or the signal processing, the data flows, some aspect of building an end-to-end -end radio telescope. And so you can see it is actually quite broad. And it's purported to be the world's largest radio telescope. And commensurately, it has the world's most ambitious science from a radio point of view that we want to actually perform with it. So the low frequency component operates between 50 and 350 megahertz. So this overlaps with digital bands, it overlaps with FM radio, uh, it overlaps with uh, a lot of different signals that we have where there are people. And therefore, for the low frequency component, we need to go somewhere where there's no people, where there's no activity from a radio um, frequency interference point of view, which is why the Western Australian desert is such a great location for this. And it's been designated as a radio quiet zone so that we can do that science. The mid frequency component um, is 350 megahertz to 14 gigahertz. That's doing slightly different science. That's in Southern Africa. But from now on, I'll, I'll concentrate on the low frequency component because that's the one that's based here in Western Australia. So what will it look like? This is uh, an image of what we expect the full array to look like. And each of those red dots is a single antenna or a single station of SKA low. And you can see the scale there is 65 kilometers. And so what you have is a core, very, very dense region and these spiral arms that spiral out. And the reason that they spiral out like that is that that allows us to image the sky on, on a range of scales at all different angles. So to be able to perform um, really good imaging. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a, a couple of slides time. You can see where it's based here at Bilardi Station. It's about a four hour drive from Geraldton. Very, very remote site as you would expect. And each of these stations is made of 256 of these log periodic dipole antennas. I'll show you an image I think on the next slide of what these look like and how big they are. But you can see here, this is a real station, a real prototype station being built in the Western Australian desert, quite close to the Murchison Widefield Array. This is an aerial view. And the footprint of that station is about 35 metres diameter. And you have 256 of these dipoles packed into this 35 metre diameter region. And that forms one aggregated signal, which is one station of the SKA. So what does that look like? Here's our engineers on site putting together this prototype station. This is what these log periodic dipoles look like. They're a bit over two metres tall, so they're a bit taller than me. Um, at Christmas time, we decorate them with, with um, Christmas lights. I mean, the ones that we have at Curtin, not the ones on site, of course. <laughs> not very good electromagnetic properties. Uh, but you can see they're snapped into this ground plane, which allows us good electromagnetics. 
and the, the small part, the short parts at the top here, those, that's the highest frequency, 350 megahertz, and then down the bottom it's very wide and that gives you the 50 megahertz. Uh, and these things could actually be put together quite quickly, but that's what the telescope will actually look like on the ground. And again, there's an aerial view from the drone of when that prototype station has been, was put together. So this is operating. We take observations with this. It helps us to test our systems and to test the performance of the telescope. So what science does the SKA want to do? So this is about pushing the limits of what we can do with radio astronomy and answering a lot of those questions that have been posed for many, many years, but we've just never had the instrumentation to be able to really push forward. So there's, there's really lofty goals here. We're, we're trying to understand full galaxy evolution, cosmology, so that's the, the, the shape and the structure of the universe over, on very large scales and the evolution of the universe and this mysterious dark energy that we think fills um, about 70% of the energy in the universe. The precision of the instrument allows us to test gravity very, very precisely. And so this is with timing of pulsars, uh, very detailed studies of black holes, really pushing Einstein's theory even further to the limit, even with the discovery of gravitational waves five years ago. Cosmic magnetism, uh, again, this is something that you can't, you can't see magnetic fields by themselves, but you can see their effect on other matter. Cosmic magnetism is something about what the magnetic fields look like on a large scale around galaxies, and this is something that we've never been able to observe before. And so again, this is where you need a very precision instrument, very high sensitivity to be able to do this type of work. Probing the cosmic dawn, this is this epoch of reionization I was talking about, and I'll go into that slightly more um, in a moment. Cradle of life is looking at those cool stars and studying planets to try and, uh, try and look for very weak signals of molecules that might, that might um, show life on other planets. And the final one here, and this is a list that comes from the SKA telescope website itself, flexible design to enable exploration of the unknown. And this is one of the real keys that takes this from just being metal on the ground telescopes, similar to the ones we have now, to something that tries to look beyond what it looks like and thinks about how you can flexibly use the system in able to do great science and sometimes even science we haven't even thought of yet. So let me concentrate a little bit on probing the cosmic dawn. This is um, the particular science area that I work in, but it's also one of the primary science goals for the low frequency component of the SKA. So really what we're trying to explore here is a birth and death of the very first generations of stars in the universe. So for a long period, the universe was in what we call the dark ages. This is about 100, 200 million years into the universe. We haven't formed the first stars yet. We don't have any sources of light. So the universe is dark. But during this time, we have sources um, collapsing under gravity. We have the baryons, the hydrogen gas falling onto them. And you can start to get that thermonuclear fusion. And what happens at the universe at that stage is that all of the hydrogen gas that is filling the, the space, the voids between those proto-galaxies in the universe, starts being eaten away by the ionizing radiation coming from those first stars. So this is hydrogen gas in its neutral form with a proton and electron combined together. It starts to get hit with photons of light from those first stars and their remnants, and that gets ripped apart and re-ionized. And what you see is that this fog of hydrogen in the universe slowly disappears in bubbles of ever increasing size around the first galaxies. That's what we want to see with the SKA. We know it happens. We've never observed it, but we know it must happen because we can see what happens before and we can see what happens afterwards. And one of the goals of the SKA is to actually observe those ionization fronts, eating away that hydrogen gas in the universe and transforming what the universe looks like. But that happens about 500 million years after the Big Bang. So we have to look a long way back for a very, very weak signal from that hydrogen in order to be able to explore that phase. And if we think about what the sky looks like now at that frequency, the sky has a temperature of about 500 to 2000 Kelvin. The signal we're looking at is about one millikelvin. So we've got six orders of magnitude dynamic range that we need to get down to if we have otherwise absolutely pristine data in order to reach this signal. So it's an experiment that you need a great telescope to, to do. So let's take a bit of a step back now into history 
And let's look at the evolution of radio telescopes and why the SKA is different to the ones that we have at the moment and have had in the past. So I'll start with ones that you might be familiar with, which is radio dishes. So on the left is the Green Bank Telescope in the United States. On the right is the Parkes Radio Telescope. You may have been there in New South Wales. 100 metres and 64 metres respectively in diameter. These observe at the higher frequencies. These observe at the frequencies where we'd be looking at hydrogen gas that is local to us. So over a gigahertz type frequencies. The wavelength of light is very small. Um, and, and these are very large telescopes to collect up a lot of information. But the Green Bank Telescope is a single pixel. And that means that all of the information from that dish goes to one point, And for a given frequency, at a given time, you measure one number, a single pixel. So if you want to image the sky, you need to raster scan around with your dish to image the sky. So it's exceptionally sensitive. It collects up a lot of photons, but it gives you one number. The Parkes dish had something put on it in the uh, late 90s called the multi-beam, and it had 13 pixels. It was a, quite a revelation. You could see 13 places in the sky at any one time. And this allowed great science, and still does. But once again, it's, it's 13 pixels, and it's all the information that hits that dish all added up together. So you can, that's great for some science. It's not great for a lot of science. So now let's move to interferometers. Interferometers are arrays of antennas. In this case, as here, they're arrays of dishes, again, at the higher frequencies. The AT Compact Array, which is in Narrabri in New South Wales, that has six dishes. And this is a very large array in New Mexico. It has 27 dishes. 25 metres in diameter and 15 metres in diameter. Again, these are operating at higher frequencies. Now, because these are an interferometer, which means that instead of just taking the information from each dish and adding it together, instead we multiply them together, what that does is it allows you to measure information on a range of scales on the sky. And I'll show a diagram in a, in a minute as to, as to what's happening here, but effectively what you can do with an array is that your field of view of the sky is set by the dish size. So you might see a large field of view on the sky, but the distance between your maximum, the maximum distance between your two antennas sets the resolution on the sky. So instead of just having one number now, you get a set of numbers at some resolution set by the side of your dish. And this is why we have interferometers. So how does that work in a pictorial way? Like I said, a single dish is a single pixel that adds up information. But what you can do with an interferometer is if you have light coming in from a particular direction, the phase of the, that wave of light as it hits this dish compared to hits, when it hits this dish is different. And that difference depends on the distance between those two antennas. And what that means is that when you measure this, what you're actually getting is a Fourier transform of the sky. So if you don't know what Fourier transform is, it doesn't matter. What it means is that you get information on a particular scale on the sky. And so if you can measure a lot of different scales by having a lot of different antennas, then you can build up an image of the sky that fills in all of those different lengths. And one way to think of an interferometer is like having a really, really large dish, but with lots of holes in it. And the bits that aren't holes, that's where the, dish, the antennas are left over. And We'd like to build a huge dish that was hundreds, or, hundreds of metres or kilometres long, but of course we can't do that because it's just not physically possible from an engineering point of view. So instead, we, we place down individual dishes and use the fact that they're in different locations to try and build up a representation of the sky. Now, what does this representation do? Well, firstly, the more holes, or in other words, the less antennas, the messier the image we get because we're just not measuring that many scales. The more complete that coverage on the ground of our antennas, the cleaner the, the image that we have. And a lot of the work that's been done in radio astronomy over the last few years is what's called deconvolution. And that's to try to get back to the real sky based on what we can actually measure, this sort of dirtiness, given that we don't measure all the scales. And I'll show that in, in a moment. But it, we also start to build up numbers really quickly. The number of baselines that we have, in other words, the number of measurements, there's one for each pair of antennas, goes effectively as n squared if n is the number of antennas you have. So if you start to build a bigger and bigger telescope, you suddenly have more and more and more measurements that you need to take into account. So here's a pictorial view 
of what imaging looks like with different arrays. So the top left here is that uh, AT compact array. What you can see here is over um, about a, a four kilometre length, there's six of these antennas in this configuration. This is what the galaxy actually looks like on the sky. And this is what the telescope gives us. So you can see it's pretty ratty, you know, you could work out it's a galaxy, but it's otherwise quite terrible. And all of this structure here is due to where those antennas are. We now move to the MWA when it started, it only had 32 antennas. We call it 32T, you can see where they are there. You've got a better distribution now. Really blobby though, because all of the information in this galaxy is on really tiny scales and the MWA doesn't have the ability to measure those scales. It's too compact. As we move through different configurations of the MWA where we have more, um, more antennas and a more complete coverage, you can see that you start to get an image of a galaxy that looks more like uh, what, what the original image looks like. And we like to take this image and try to understand what the underlying image must look like, given that we know what this footprint of the telescope does to our data. So that's called deconvolution. And you can see here that we have 128 antennas. We now have 8,128 numbers. And the same here, because this is also 128 antennas. Very different to the previous generation of radio telescopes, where you have 15, 20, 30 baselines to deal with. Now, so far I've been mostly talking about dishes, but dishes is what we use at the higher frequencies, and that's because the light is very short wavelength. A dish is very, very efficient at collecting up a lot of information, a lot of different photons, and being able to focus it to that one point. When we're looking at ro low radio frequencies, the wavelengths become much longer, and in fact, the wavelength of light that we care about for looking at those first stars is about my height. Okay, so if you have a dish, it suddenly becomes a very inefficient way of collecting up that information. And so instead, we use what we might have used with our old TVs when we'd have our little TV antennas. Uh, and we use something that can actually just have um, the, the electric field of the light actually just accelerating electrons backwards and forwards and producing a voltage, just like a TV antenna does. And these dipoles, they're about that big. They're well matched to the frequencies of our low frequency radio telescope. And this is a much more efficient way of collecting the radio light than a dish. So we use these dipole antennas. And you can think of a dish as really just focusing onto one dipole. This is where we just have the dipoles on the ground. And each of these, the signals from each of these is just added together to again give one number. So this is one dish, even though it's made from 16 dipoles. We do that to get the sensitivity. So there's 16 inputs for each of these dishes and the MWA has 128 of these. We call them tiles or stations. Okay, so what do we do with that? Okay, so now let's go to the SKA, let's scale up. So in its rawest, most basic form, SKA low is 512 stations and each of these stations has 256 of these long periodic dipoles that are this tall. So that means there's 131,072 dipoles across the full array, across that 65 kilometres. And if we form one of these into a single dish or a single antenna, then the number of measurements we have between each of those combinations is about the same number, about 131,000. So we've gone from that 1530 up to the 8,000. Now we're at 131,000 measurements that we have that we need to use to do our science. And what does this, um, and it beca becomes relevant when we start talking about uh, software telescopes, if we now look at what the core of the SKA looks like, SKA low looks like. So as a reminder, this is 65 kilometres in total. The actual core, this is 2,000 metres to 2,000 metres. So that's the central four kilometres. That there is the central kilometre. 296 of those 512 stations is in that central kilometre. So you can just imagine how closely packed they are, that you no longer have an easy distinction between these 296 of these stations, and instead you have a bit more of a sea of dipoles. They're still in these stations, they're still around like this, but some of them get very close to adjoining with each other, and you have a central region which is now packed with a large number of dipoles, 
what you'd like to be able to do with that is harness all that metal on the ground to be able to flexibly define your telescope to do your science. And that's the vision for the SKA. So this artist's impression here, I don't actually like because the stations are too far apart. In reality, some of them will be this far apart from each other. Some of them will be almost adjoining. I mean, not adjoining, adjoining, of course, because you don't want metal right next to each other. But some of them will be much, much closer. And so how you define what a station looks like and what dipoles you assign to each station suddenly becomes something that you can adapt and be flexible with, depending on how you want to shape your telescope and what science you want to do. That's a software telescope from an astronomer's point of view. So it's been talked about as the sea of elements. Sea of elements is a bit of a stretch. Um, that was a vision where really the dipoles were just randomly laid out over that kilometre. That's not going to be the case. But instead, we're going to have something that's closer to this sort of hybrid station or subarraying idea, which is where within a station itself, we can select a subset of dipoles and instead use that as a station, have another one next to it, another one next to it, and suddenly you have a telescope that has very different properties. If your stations get smaller, that means that they see a, a larger field of view of the sky. It also means that the scales that they measure changes because where your, your individual stations are with respect to each other that told you about the angular scales, that's also adapted and changed. And so for your science, you might want to have smaller stations with a larger field of view, or you might like to have larger stations with a smaller field of view. And that's what we're trying to do with the SKA, depending on the science that we have. So as an example, this is from a presentation I gave a, a few years ago um, about trying to do this type of thing with the SKA. For the science that we care about, right, earlier on I talked about these ionising bubbles that are sort of these ionisation fronts that are moving out from those very first stars and galaxies eating away that hydrogen gas and having these sort of bubbles of, of ionised hydrogen. Depending on the time you look in the universe, those bubbles are smaller or larger. And in fact, when our stations are the full 35 metres, some of them give a view of the sky that's not big enough to feel a bubble. The bubbles are actually bigger than our view of the sky. And so for, in that case, we'd like to have smaller stations that can see a larger field of view of the sky to be able to image at least a bubble in its surrounds to be able to do the science properly. So that's a very simple case of where we'd like to be able to be flexible with our definition of the telescope so that we can do the science that we actually care about. Um, and you can see we have the packing problem, you know, how, if you want to have circular stations because they have nice, um, that their, their view of the sky is, is, is well behaved, then there might be some dipoles that get left behind and not used. But, but this was sort of the, the discussion that we were having. And then we looked at what the scientific outcomes of this type of process could be. So all right, as I, as I come towards the end here, I'm going to talk about the two steps of sort of data analysis in the SKA that, that have kind of a, a big number um, flavor to them. The first I'm going to call capture. So this is just the raw numbers of the data rates coming into the processing facility itself. And I'm going to call this indicative numbers because of this idea that we can be flexible with how we define our telescope. And so you, th this can change. And up to the compute power of your processor, you can adapt how you actually, um, how you actually do these, these, different, these different numbers that then make these choices about what your telescope looks like. So we have 512 of these stations. Each of them has 256 of these randomised dipoles. And, and each of them can have about 250,000 or a bit more frequency channels at any one time. We have two polarizations, so two different angles on the sky that we're viewing. And um, let's say that we're observing with a 0.1 second cadence. We can actually go to higher resolution, but this is sort of an indicative number. So the data rate, just raw data rate going into the processor for that is 10 to the 17 bytes per hour, which is 100 petabytes per hour for six to eight hours per night. So that's just raw numbers. You can't do science with that. That's just too much data. And so the next step is to do some type of time averaging and frequency averaging to try to reduce that data to something that's more manageable to do your science. 
And the key to that is to ensuring that, sorry, I'm standing in front of you, ensuring that you're not destroying your science information by doing that averaging. The other thing that has to come along with that is the metadata. And this is the real key bit for the next part, which I'm going to call analysis. So these numbers are big. That's fine. These are big data rates, but it's not really a problem. If you have a computer big enough, you can just handle it. So that's fine. We'll do. So we can handle that. The bigger step, the bigger problem with the SKA is using that data, those data effectively to actually do the science we want to do. So I'm going to call this analysis, which really means getting the precision science from the metal on the ground, from the data. And why is this difficult when you have a telescope as complex and as flexible as we hope the SKA will be? This is just a couple of examples. There are other steps of complexity, but here's a couple that, that I'd like to show you. So these are movies of what the ionosphere is doing to the positions of galaxies on the sky that we measure with the MWA. So the ionosphere is a, uh, a plasma in the upper atmosphere. It refracts and diffracts radio waves. They come through the, the ionosphere and it appears to shift the positions of sources around. And we can measure that. This, this telescope, the SKA, will be big enough that the ionosphere above one part of the array and the ionosphere above another part of the array are not behaving the same way. They're doing different things. So in real time, we need to be able to understand what the ionosphere is doing so that we can de-distort that wave field. So that's one piece of complexity that we need to deal with. The second one is that we need to understand how each of these individual stations views the sky. Okay? And that's because every single one of them is different. They're all a different randomised layout of these 256 dipoles. So here's an example on the left of a, a station configuration. That will have a particular response on the sky. And because it's made up of little individual dipoles and not some nice smooth dish, it means at the edges of the sky you get all sorts of funny features, all sorts of um, lobes and nulls. And you don't want that in your data because that's really difficult to deal with. And that's the reason why every one of them is different. So that if you form an image out of all of them, that you hope that all of those little effects at the edges will average out. And there's been work to show that. And that's what this shows here. This is a, a, uh, a cut through what we might expect the beam or the response of the telescope to look like. And if you just look at the solid curve, this is in decibels. So this is factors of 10 in power as we're going down by um, each um, 10 decibels engineer units. Um, you can see that some of these, um, what we call side lobes here, are relatively suppressed. But nonetheless, you get all sorts of interesting stuff at the edge of the sky. And you really don't want to have to deal with this. Because if you get this wrong, it means that the sources on the out of your field of view are actually going to affect your science. So averaging many stations does smooth this out, which is great. But it means that in your data, you have 512 different response models that you need to understand in real time in order to be able to undo their effects on your data. And part of the issue with this is that understanding what the response of this looks like on the sky is non-trivial, requires very complex electromagnetic simulations, and even they get it wrong because ultimately this telescope is made of bits of metal that sit close to each other. When you have bits of metal sitting close to each other, they interact and they couple. And there's a lot of modelling going on at the moment. This is somewhere that Doug might be able to help. Actually, Doug is helping with this exact calculation um, to try and work out what that effect is because it's very, very computationally complex to work that out. And here's some examples of, of what that actually looks like. So on the left here is some uh, sort of not cartoon, but they're theoretical models of what the response in the sky of a single dipole looks like, just a single antenna, it sees the whole sky, which is what you're seeing here with this colour. When you put 256 of them together in one station, you get this, and so you can see the edges are now significantly suppressed and you get that main, main lobe. And then when you put all of these 512 stations together, you can see everything's averaging out very nicely. 